morning, River Oaks and Elkhart. Good morning. Good morning. Amen. Good morning, guys. Man. So true. There's no other reason why we're here. God is worthy of all of our honor. He's worthy of all of our praise. And that's the only reason we're here. We're here to lift up his name. My name is Scott Matthews. I'm your campus pastor. And if, if this is your first time here, we hope you feel at home here at River Oaks and Elkhart. We are one of three campuses, uh, but our goal for our entire church is to make fully devoted followers of Jesus who go, grow, and show their faith. And we feel like God has us in this season where we're trying to go after all people, be intentional after going after everybody in our community, whether, whether you're rich, poor, old, young, black, white, Hispanic. We feel like God has called us to just be intentional about reaching all people in our city, and that's why we're here doing it together under the name of Jesus. And we're going to continue this Kingdom Come series. We've been looking at the teachings of Jesus uh, as we look through the book of Matthew. And we've been looking at this, this, his, his message about the kingdom of God coming to earth. If you guys haven't figured it out yet, this is Jesus' most important message uh, of all time. This is what he talked about so much, the good news about the kingdom. Jesus is a king. And as the church, we are his people. That's what we got to understand. And Jesus spent so much of his time here on earth teaching and showing us what it's like to be in his kingdom. The, let me paint this picture for you. The people of Israel that Jesus came to were under the, the control of Rome. And, and Rome had taken them over. And their, their, their Hebrew scriptures, which is our Old Testament, prophesied that a Messiah would come and set them free. A, 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 an anointed king would set them free. But little did the people of Israel know that this anointed king didn't come just to set Israel free from Rome. It was so much deeper than that. He came, he came to set free all of mankind, to set free all of mankind from sin, death, and Satan. He came to set us all free. God's kingdom wasn't just going to be some little strip of land on the Mediterranean Sea. His kingdom was going to reign in the hearts of mankind through every generation. That was the point of his kingdom. That's why he came. And when, this, when everything would be said and done, his kingdom would be established for all eternity again on earth. Now, we're not going to fully experience the kingdom of God until Jesus comes and returns and, and judges the world. But he came to give us a taste of, what, of that experience today of what it's like to be in his kingdom through the Holy Spirit. He came to give us new life here on earth as we live here. Jesus came to be the sacrifice to pay the penalty for our sin so that we could be reconnected back to the Father and enjoy the blessings of the kingdom. Guys, those blessings of the kingdom, number one, are eternal life. That means when you die, you won't die. That means when we have your funeral, we can be happy because there's going to be a resurrection one day. That's a blessing of the kingdom. There's peace that surpasses all understanding. There's joy and purpose in this life. There's so much that we can look forward to in the kingdom of God. And there's power over the Satan's kingdom. Even while we go through hardships and troubles here in life, the king said he would be with us every step of the way, each and every step of the way when we go through hardships in life. That's what it's about being in the kingdom of God. That's what we have to look forward to as followers of Jesus. Guys, let me tell you something. No amount of money can buy you that. None can buy you that. You cannot get for yourself the level of peace, joy, love, and power that we experience in the kingdom of God. You can only experience that through a surrendered life to the king. It's only where you can find that. So Jesus preaches the kingdom of heaven is like, he keeps telling the people the kingdom of heaven is like this. The kingdom of heaven is like that. He's just telling us over and over how important it is to seek his kingdom and its righteousness. He showed us his kingdom and he showed us how to do it. Jesus says, this is how you seek my kingdom. This is what my followers do. My followers love their enemies. My followers show mercy even when they don't want to show mercy. My, my followers allow, allow uh, other followers to judge them in a loving, humble way, like Pastor Luis talked about. My, 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 followers, my followers aren't driven by a love for money and, and ambition because they know that the Father in heaven takes care of the birds. He'll also take care of us. That's the lifestyle we live in the kingdom. And Jesus is saying, if, if the world sees my followers living like that, it would change the world. It would make my followers salt and light if they live like that. 
It, Jesus is saying, if my followers live the way I call them to live, that kingdom lifestyle, their neighborhoods, their schools, their marriages, their communities would, would, would be amazing. There would be a lot less people like Vladimir Putin. There would be a lot less people like Fidel Castro or, or, or Saddam Hussein. If the church took seriously and understood the message of the kingdom, it would change families, it would change neighborhoods, it would change communities because Jesus is the hope of the world. Let me say that again. Jesus is the hope of the world. Yeah. That's the power of the gospel, you guys. And that power to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth is available to us today through his Holy Spirit. So Jesus tells us how to pray. He says, guys, this is how you pray. Pray that the Father's kingdom would come. Pray that his will would be done on earth just like it is in heaven. Jesus says, pray that. And boy, don't we need God's presence in heaven today. Don't we need the presence of God to come flood our earth? And I'll tell you what, it seems like after two years of a pandemic and all the issues around that, it seems like we're finally coming out of that. Now it's like we're going into World War III. And it's like, God, what do we do? Right, guys, I'm going to tell you this. God is going to continue to show the world that we are nothing without him. Amen. That's a good place. God is going to continue to show this world that we are nothing without the Father. We're nothing without him. Guys, let me tell you something. Our money alone cannot save us. Our governments cannot save us. Our Congress, our negotiating skills, our scientific advancements alone. These things are great. But we cannot put our hope in these things alone. There is one name under heaven by which man might be saved, and that is Jesus. Jesus says he is the light of the world. He he is the light of the world. His light leads to life. He's the strong tower that we run to for safety. He's the good shepherd who takes care of his sheep. And he gives us the blueprint. Yeah, I'm going to tell you something. Yeah, it might seem crazy. Yeah you, might, yeah, you might be saying, Scott, are you, are you serious that Jesus says that the church can change the world by how we live? Yes. Let me tell you something, guys. The, God solving man's problems is never conventional. The, the, the things that God does to take care of mankind's problems, it never makes sense. It never makes sense for, for us. It never makes sense the way God takes care of us. King David says some trust in chariots, some trust in horses. But we will trust in the name of the Lord our God. Guys, that's any, I'll tell you this. Anytime mankind tries to be his own savior, we fail. We screw it up. We mess it up. But Jesus says, if you seek me, if you seek my kingdom in all of its righteousness, I will give mankind everything he needs. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He says, I'm the prince of peace. And don't we need peace? Whether it's peace in our minds whether it's it's peace in our families and in our marriages, whether it's peace between two countries who are at war, we need the Prince of Peace to flood our lives, don't we? We need God to just to, to, to be here and take over. Jesus knows what mankind needs, and it starts with seeking his kingdom. As a matter of fact, God told King Solomon when he was building the temple, he said, Solomon, if I allow pestilence and, and I close up the heavens that there be no rain, and if I allow famine and disease, but he said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, God said, then I'll hear from heaven and I'll forgive their sin and heal their land. That is why this message of the kingdom is so important. Church, we cannot miss this. So throughout this series, we've been unpacking that message of the kingdom. And last week, Pastor Luis told us what judging each other looks like in the kingdom of God. And this week, we're just going to track through the Sermon on the Mount in the book of Matthew. And we're going to hit this other place where Jesus talks about the narrow gate. He talks about entering this kingdom, what what it looks like to enter the kingdom of God. What what does this mean to enter his kingdom? Let let me show you that through the narrow gate. This is what he says. Matthew chapter 7. Turn me there if you brought your Bibles. Matthew 7 verse 13 says this. You can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad, and its gate is wide for many who choose that way. But the gate to life is very narrow, and the road is difficult, and only a few ever find it. What a powerful and pointed statement Jesus makes. He tells us why so many people refuse 
to accept him. The, the cost of following Jesus, you guys, is high. Entering the kingdom of God. What, what does that mean? That is salvation. That is being born again. That is giving your life to Christ. That, that, that's giving your life to him. We simply put our, our, our faith in Jesus Christ as Savior. That's where it starts. You don't have to do anything to enter God's kingdom. What you do is you, you give him your, your faith. You put your trust in him. That's where it starts. Because it's by grace that we've been saved. But the path to walk that experience of new life out isn't easy. I'll tell you this. Jesus knew that the majority of people who were following him in the crowd wouldn't stay with him. Jesus knew that, that, that most of the people who were following him did not understand the cost of what it really meant to follow him. He understood that. Jesus knew that some people who were following him, he knew that some of them were, were thorny ground. He knew that some of them were, 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 were a shallow soil, and he knew that some of them were, were, were good ground. Jesus knew, Jesus knew that a lot of people who followed him only wanted what they could get. He knew that. He, he knew that people, some people followed him not because he was the son of God, but because of what they could get out of him. He knew that. Let me show you this real quick. John chapter 2. You don't have to turn there. But John 2, verse 23, says this. Because of the miraculous signs Jesus did in, in Jerusalem at the Passover celebration, many began to trust in him. That's great. That's, that's amazing. But Jesus didn't trust them because he knew all about people. No one needed to tell him about human nature, for he knew what was in each person's heart. Jesus knew that all these people who were following him weren't following him because he was the son of God. He knew people followed him only for what they could get, not because they wanted to truly submit to him as Lord and Savior. So Jesus says, narrow is the gate that leads to life in the kingdom. Narrow. Guys, there's two paths in life. Don't let anybody ever fool you. There's only two paths in life. There's one path we take that's going to lead to, to eternal life and, and care under the shepherd, and the other path leads to destruction eternally. That's the only two paths we have, guys. And that choice is up to you. Church, there is no gray area. Satan wants us to think that there's a gray area, that the gray area to, 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 to sit in. But we, we have to take the narrow path that Jesus says is the only way. And one way you can interpret that only path that Jesus talks about as the narrow way to life is understanding that he is the only way to the Father. Jesus said this in John chapter 14, verse 6. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father except through me. That's the narrow gate. He says, I am the only one to the Father. Jesus made it very clear. He is the only way to eternal life and entrance into the kingdom. We place our faith in him as the Son of God. Guys, don't ever let somebody tell you because they believe in a higher power that's not Jesus, that it's the same as believing in Jesus. It's not the same. There's only one way to God. And it's by believing in Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior. There's only one way. I'll tell you what. We live in a very spiritual society right now. There's a lot of people who are very spiritual. And that's good and then that's bad. Our, our society is, is, is spiritual. It's good, uh, it's good on one hand because we do need to understand that there's more to this life than just what we see. But our society being spiritual is also bad because it, so many people have their own interpretations of what, of, of what life after death means or, or what anything else means. Some people believe that They've had a rebirth or they've had an awakening because they heard the teachings of Buddha or, or Baha'i or Muhammad or Confucius. And, and I'll tell you, some of these guys, they're great, they have great teachings. I'll be honest, some of these are great teachings. Many of these faiths believe a lot of the same morals and ethics that, that Jesus taught. They do. Doing the right thing to people, you guys, that is not an exclusively Christian teaching. Okay, doing the right thing is not exclusively teaching. Not lying, not cheating, not stealing. That, that's a pretty universal understanding. If you ever heard of the codes of Hammurabi and, and, and other, other codes of ethics that so many other nations had. If you read the book of Romans, God, God tells us this. The Bible says that God has put a conscience down inside of every human being, no matter who you are, because we all come from him. Everybody was born with some level of moral conscience. Everybody was. Let me show you this, Romans 2. You don't have to turn there. Paul puts it like this. Paul says, even the Gentiles who don't have God's written law show that they know his law when they instinctively obey it, even without having heard it. They demonstrate that God's law is written in their hearts for their own consciences. 
and thoughts either accuse them or tell them they are doing right. God puts basic morality inside of all of us. We are all born with a conscience. As a matter of fact, Matthew chapter 7, verse 12 is, is the golden rule. I learned about the golden rule in school before I learned about it in, at church. What's the golden rule? Treat other people the way you want to be treated. Do unto others as you would want them to do unto you. Many different faith backgrounds teach that same type of thing. But, <laughs> but Jesus makes some statements that makes him exclusive. Jesus makes some statements that none of these others can back up and actually do. Jesus makes claims that take him out of the great thinker and guru class into the God and one and only God class. Jesus said, his disciples, Jesus said this to his disciples. He said, guys, when you see me, you see the Father. He said, the Father and I are one. That's a claim that nobody else can make. <laughs> Jesus even told the Israelite people, that the people of Israel loved Abraham. They loved him. And Jesus told the people of Israel, he said, guys, before Abraham was, I am. That made them hot. <laughs> they hated that. Jesus is one with the Father, and there's no other path to the Father except through him. Guys, even before Jesus came to the earth physically, God made himself known to people as the one and only God. Even before he came. Let me prove it to you. Romans chapter 1. You don't have to turn there, but I'll show it to you. Romans 1, verse 20. That's what Paul says. He says, for ever since the world was created, people of every generation, of every nation, nationality of every nation, people have seen the earth and the sky. Through everything God made, they, everybody, can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. None of us do, he says. Yes, they, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think of foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. So what did God do? He abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshiped and served the things God created instead of the creator himself who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. Guys, there is only one God. That's God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all in one. It is the Father in heaven. And there's only one way to the creator, and that is through his son, Jesus Christ. Narrow is the gate. I know it seems very narrow-minded. But it's okay. Narrow is the gate. He is the only way. Now, I'll tell you what. You can listen to great sayings of wise people. There's a lot of good sayings out there. There's a lot of good sayings and moralistic teaching of people who aren't Christian. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But only one person died for your sin to make you right with God, and that's Jesus. Only one person died for your sin to make you right with the Father. And that is where we place our faith. We enter the kingdom of God through that narrow truth. That's where we enter. Now look what Jesus says. Jesus says this. John chapter 3, verse 3. says, Jesus replied, I'll tell you the truth. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus told that to a man named Nicodemus at like 2 o'clock in the morning. You can't enter the kingdom of God unless you are born again, born brand new. Then he says this in Matthew chapter 18, verse 3. I tell you the truth, unless you turn from me, your sin, unless you turn from me and turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. So anyone who becomes as humble as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. It's amazing. Narrow is the way to enter the kingdom of God. Jesus says, for, number one, we got to be born again. And, and, that means we give our life to him. Our life is made new. And we have to be humble and ready to believe like a little child, he says, to enter the kingdom of God. It, if you ever uh, looked at your little kids, three, four years old, your grandkids, let's look, they'll believe anything. They'll trust you. They'll hear what you have to say. Jesus said we have to be just like that with our faith. Be ready to believe. 
You might not know every detail. You might not understand everything in the Bible. You might not dot every T and cross every I. But he says, just simply trust and believe me and watch what I do. He says, believe me like, like, a, like a young child does. So important that we understand that. But so many people will never do that. And that's why Jesus says few will enter. Few people will truly submit to him as Lord as the only way. And I'll tell you one of the big reasons that Scripture tells us is Satan causes blindness. Satan blinds the eyes of those who don't believe. That's one of the issues we have. Now, now look at this next verse. Let me, let me expand on that. John chapter 10. I'll read this to you. John 10 verse 9. Jesus says, yes, I'm the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. Not just those who listen to universal teaching. Those who come in through me will be saved. They will come and go freely and they will find good pasture. The thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. But my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. God's purpose is to give you a life in abundance, you guys. That's God's purpose. Jesus is saying when you look to enter through me, when you submit to me as Lord and live by my teachings, I will take care of you like a shepherd takes care of his sheep. I'll give you a rich and satisfying life. Now, he doesn't say a perfect life. God never promised you a perfect life. But what he did was promise you a life that, that is full of abundance and a life that is, that is rich and satisfying. And isn't that what we're looking for? Isn't that what 7.6 billion people on planet Earth are looking for? A, a rich and satisfying life. That's why people immigrate to different countries. That's why people go to different uh, faith teachings. That's why people uh, choose different religions. That's why you work two and three different jobs. That's why you send your kids to school so that they can have a good life. That's why you move to different cities because you are looking for a rich and satisfying life. That's fine. Jesus said it starts with him. It starts with seeking his kingdom. But we have to look to him first. It starts with submitting to him as Lord and living by his terms. We approach God on his terms, not on our terms, you guys. If, 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 we, if we're going to truly experience the fullness of the kingdom, this is one of the reasons we don't really experience the fullness of walking with God. is because we cannot approach God on our own terms. We can't. That's what, that's what it makes it seem difficult, this road of following Jesus. He laid out what it means to follow him. I'll tell you, being a believer in Jesus is not convenient. It's not convenient to your schedule. Being a true follower of Jesus is not something you can fit on your little weekly calendar. Being a true follower of Jesus is sacrificial. It takes time. It takes effort. It, it takes our 100% commitment and faith. We give up this life so that we can enjoy life in the kingdom. We give up building our own kingdom so that we can join him in building his kingdom. Jesus said, any person who wants to follow me must what? Deny themselves. Pick up their cross daily and follow him. If you, lose, if you hang on to this life, he says, you'll lose it. But if you give it up, he said, if you lay down your life as a sacrifice for me, God says, you'll find life. So, so many people don't choose to follow Jesus because that personal life of sacrifice is too much. Oh, we love to talk about grace and mercy, don't we? And that's fine because that's where it starts. We love to talk about grace and mercy. We love to talk about placing our faith in Jesus. That's great. That's where it starts. But you also have to talk about the cost of walking that faith out. You have to talk about the cost of what it takes to lay down your life all the time, every single day. We have to talk about that. And when you hear that, it sounds difficult. When you hear that as a follower of Jesus, we have to love our enemies, we don't want that road. When you hear that as a follower of Jesus, if we look at another man or a woman with lust in our mind, we've already committed adultery. We don't like that road. It's too difficult. When we hear that persecution and, 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 and trouble and, and, hard, and hardships come with following Jesus, we don't like that. When Jesus tells us that we have to build our treasure in heaven and not on earth, we don't like that. So we say it's too difficult. We don't follow him down that road. Everything that Jesus tells us makes it narrow. Because everything Jesus tells us to do runs against mainstream culture. So, so many people do not follow him. Jesus says, wide is the other path, though. Wide is the gate that leads to destruction. 
because that path is so inviting. The, the world tries to make it seem like the other path of not following Jesus doesn't make sense because the other path accommodates everybody's opinion. The, the, the other path leaves us comfortable in our sin. The, the, the other path leaves us com- comfortable in our own pleasure. The, the, the other path is so inviting. It's the path of least resistance. And guys, I'll tell you what. That is the path that Satan wants to blind us and, and so deceptively takes us down. That, that, that is exactly the deceptive bait that Satan, want, Satan wants you to take. Don't follow Jesus because it's too hard. Don't follow Jesus because all that stuff that he talks about doing is too much. Live this lifestyle. That's Satan's bait. Yes, guys, I'll tell you what. Entering the kingdom of God, yes, it comes with hardship. Surrendering your life with Jesus, yeah, it's a narrow path. It does come with hardship. That's the reality. Paul said this in Acts chapter 22. He told the church this. He said, we have to endure many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. We have to. Paul told that to the church in Galatia after he was stoned and left for dead. Paul was was teaching all kinds of people all over the the area. And many people were coming to see God in in, in, uh, amazing ways. But here Paul ends up almost dead. There's a sacrifice, guys. There's a sacrifice of, 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 of laying our life down. Maybe it's not physically like that, but we have to lay our life down. Narrow is the gate. Narrow is the way. But it also comes with amazing rewards that this world could never give. Being reconciled back to the Father is a beginning of a new life that you can never get on your own. So Jesus says, enter the kingdom of God through the narrow path. See that he's the only way. Live by his teachings and submit to him. So then Jesus, as he just continues to go down this this path, it seems like he takes another turn. And he starts talking about false teachers. And he he really doesn't. He just continues his, his teaching. He says, false teachers, these are wolves in sheep's clothing. False teachers only tell you what, they, what you want to hear. He said the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. The thief are false teachers that Jesus is talking about. False shepherds, false leaders who only want to tell people what they want to hear and claim that it's God's message. Let's read, let's read what he says here. Matthew chapter 7, verse, verse 15. It says, beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep but are really vicious wolves. You can identify them by their fruit. That is, by the way they act. Can you pick grapes from thorn bushes? No. Can you get figs from thistles? Absolutely not. A good tree produces good fruit, and a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown in the fire. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, you can identify people by their actions. Jesus makes it very simple. He says you can identify a leader. If you can identify if somebody has taken the narrow road in their life by how they live. Don't just listen to what people say. Jesus said watch how they live. I don't care how powerful or charismatic of a speaker they are. I don't care how well they sing. I don't care how well they play an instrument. I don't care how much influence or leadership ability they have. Jesus says watch the fruit that they produce in their life. Watch their lifestyle, he says. Guys, your life is the most important sermon you'll ever preach. It is. Your life is the most important worship song you'll ever sing. Your lifestyle. Jesus says, look at their life. Does it line up to the narrow path that Jesus is telling us about? He's not talking about perfection. But he's talking about does does your life line up with the path that he's leading us down? See, guys, many of the teachers and the rabbis of Jesus' day, I'll tell you what, they were motivated by money. They were motivated by power. They were motivated by fame. Being a rabbi in Jesus' day was a prestigious position. So many people were just motivated to, 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 to have this, this prestigious uh, position. And the harsh reality is it's really no different today in the church. Watch how people teach and watch how they lead. Do they minimize Jesus and glorify themselves? Do they teach only what people want to hear? Do they teach all of what Jesus, what Jesus says, even when we don't like it? Do, 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 the, do the leaders that you follow, do they accept man's kind logic and his traditions as truth, even when it goes against God's word? 
Do, do they try to twist God's word to fit the culture? He says, watch that. Because narrow is the path. Paul actually told the church in Colossae, he said, guys, he said this, don't let anybody capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense. Paul said, do not let anybody capture you with, with human thinking and spiritual principles of this world that are not from Christ. He said, those people are wolves in sheep's clothing. Guys, Paul warned the church. He said, guys, don't be immature. Don't be tossed back and forth like immature kids who are, who, who are, who are moved by every new teaching you're running over here and every new teaching you're running over there. Paul says, be steadfast in your faith. So important we understand that. Guys, I'll tell you this. Let me, let me explain something to you. There's a lot of Christian authors, a lot of pastors, a lot of Christian leaders who are very articulate. They write books. They write sermons. They all do all kinds of things. But these things do not line up to the truth. They do not do that. They have twisted God's word to fit the culture and everybody's lifestyle. Listen, I, I'll tell you this. I'll tell you this. We have to connect to the world in relevant ways. We do. That's the church. We're supposed to do that as the church. But we never connect to the world at the cost of the truth of God's word. We never do that. We never submit the word of God in an attempt to reach people. If God says something is wrong, you guys, it's wrong. If God says something is an abomination, it's an abomination. If God says something is good, then it's good. No vote, no legislation can change that. Nothing can change. No activist group can change that. Yes, narrow is the gate. Jesus said narrow is the gate that leads to life. And wide is the gate that leads to destruction. Why does he give us these commands? Because he loves us. Because he's like a good parent who loves his kids. It gets worse. <laughs> Let me tell you this. Let's keep going. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Jesus says this. He says, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name. We perform miracles. But Jesus said, I'll reply, I never knew you. Get away from you, you who break God's law. And I tell you what, that's something that keeps me humble every time I read it. Every single time I read it. That's one scripture that just keeps my mind right here. Je Jesus said, just because you claim to follow Jesus, especially as a pastor, as an elder, a deacon, a prophet, an evangelist, doesn't mean you really do. Jesus said on judgment day when we all stand before him, we all, we all will stand before him. And people will say, Lord, I led Bible studies for you. I, I led conferences for you. We built big churches for you. We did all kinds of different things for you. And Jesus will say, depart from me because you took the wide gate. You took the wide path. You didn't take the narrow path. So important that we see that. God says, I saw your heart. Everything you did was about your name and your kingdom. You moved out of jealousy. You wanted ministry for power and for, pain, and, and for fame. You twisted my words to fit people's sin instead of lovingly calling them out of it. God said, depart from me. Guys, please do not be deceived by anybody's ability or leadership. Watch how they live. And you need the Holy Spirit to help you discern that. You need the Holy Spirit to help you discern that. Jesus said this in Matthew 23, verse 27. He says, what sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law, Pharisees? He's talking to leaders, guys, hypocrites. For you're like whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, but filled on the inside with dead people's bones and all sort of, imp of impurity. Outwardly, you look like your church people, but inwardly, your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. Man, I tell you what, Jesus was calling out false teachers left and right. He says, you look holy. You look like you got it together. You look like everything, everything is right, but on the inside, you're motivated by selfishness and greed. Now, Jesus isn't talking about perfect people. He's talking about leaders who are in the church, who, have, who put on this persona of, per of perfection. But deep down inside, they have a, a clear attitude for lawlessness. J J Jesus, as a matter of fact, calls them lukewarm. He says, you're lukewarm. That's why he hates false teachers so much. He said, I'd rather you be hot or cold. Just, I'd rather you be for me or against me. Don't be lukewarm because it confuses people. Just be for me or against me. It leads people astray. The Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. So Jesus says, don't let that be you. Not my followers. 
They're led by truth and sound teaching. Last scripture. Paul says this to a young man named Timothy, a young pastor. First, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. Paul says, preach the word of God, Timothy. Do it when they want to hear it. Do it when they don't want to hear it. Do it when they're ready for it. Do it when they're not ready for it. Preach the word, Timothy. He says, preach the word, whether the time is favorable or not. Patiently correct people. Rebuke people. Encourage your people with good teaching. For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and they'll chase after myths. Jesus is saying, don't let that be you. Paul warns Timothy, and God warns us today to follow the original teachings of Jesus, whether we like it or not. Just like you have a good doctor. If you go, who wants their doctor to lie to them? Think about it. If you go to your doctor, would you want your doctor to tell you the truth? Because you want to live. If your doctor came up to you and said, you know what, I don't want to tell them all this. No, 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 I want to live. Please tell me the truth. If your doctor says, look, you can't eat hamburgers and french fries and, and, uh, every single day of the week, you got to change your diet, man, if you want to live. What are you going to say to the doctor? Doctor, no, I can't do that. Doctor, that's too narrow. Doctor, you need to tell me I, I, I got I to gotta, I gotta drink water and change my diet and do all this stuff? I'm not doing That's too narrow, doctor. I don't want to do that. Okay, well, we'll just start planning for your funeral then. Every a good doctor will tell us what we want to hear and what we need to hear. False teachers will tell us what we want, but Jesus will tell us what we need. He says, take the narrow road, follow the truth, even when it doesn't feel good. He says, I'll lead you into good pasture, into the kingdom of God. Let me get you out of here. I already know you lost the hour. <laughs> we enter the kingdom of God, you guys, by surrendering to Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We take that by faith. That's where it starts. We experience the kingdom of God through taking the narrow gate. We follow what Jesus says and we put it into practice and we'll find good pasture. He's a good shepherd. Guys, I'll tell you what, our world needs to see the kingdom of God through the church. People need to see how you live differently in your marriage. They need to see how you act at school if you're a student. They need to see how you, how you handle being offended. They need to see how you raise your family. People need to see how you are different than the rest of the world because you are under the law of a different government. You're under the laws of the kingdom of God. People need to see that. How does heaven respond to life? That's how we respond as followers of Jesus. People need to see that. That's, that's the narrow gate. We enter through the narrow gate. And when people see you living like that, they see the life, you the, the fruit that you produce, it'll bring glory to the Father. Now, guys, as we leave out of here, please, please get in your Bibles this week. We're, we, we've been continuing through the, the book of Matthew. Uh, read with us this week, Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 23. It should be up here on the screen right there. Get into the Word of God. If you truly want to know what Jesus teaches and how to apply it. You got to get in God's word, guys. You got to spend time with him. Yeah. An hour on Sunday morning isn't going to cut it. You got to spend time with God this week. You got to spend time in prayer. Spend time reading God's word. Read with us this week, Matthew chapter 7, verse 20, uh, 12, 13 through 23. We want you to fall in love with reading God's word because the world needs to see the kingdom of God through us. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for another day. God, I thank you for the people in this room who have assembled here. God, help us to see that you are the only way, the truth, and the life. God, we're living in a world right now that is so broken and so dysfunctional. God, none of this surprises you. God, you are calling us to be your church. God, this simple people like us, people sitting in an auditorium, in an auditorium right now who, who call themselves believers, we can change the world. We can be salt and light. Help us to not move out of fear, Father. Help us, to, help us to put you first in everything that we do so that the world can see the kingdom of God through us. God, we need you like never before. And I don't know what anybody walked in here with. I don't know what issues, problems, concerns, or pains they're dealing with. But help them know, Father, that if they look to you and seek your kingdom first, you'll give us everything we need. We trust you and we love you.
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand.